51 East Bay Street for this week's edition of the Coaches Show with the head coach of the Bulldogs, Coach Brent Thompson. Coaches Show brought to you by Cutwater Spirits as we spend the next hour talking Citadel football. We'll look back at this last game and get ready for the next one, the final home game of the year coming up Saturday against Wofford for the Citadel Bulldogs. Coach, good evening. How are you? I'm good. You know, I'm good. I enjoyed that win last night by Coach Balkan and the basketball team and I want to congratulate those guys. Yeah, absolutely. Big time win for the Citadel basketball team to start the season last night in Pittsburgh, beating Pittsburgh 80, uh, beating them by, I don't remember the final score, but they beat them by 16, that's all that matters, and it was the first win for the Citadel against an ACC team since 1979, first win against a Power 5 team since 1989, so a big time win for the Bulldogs last night to begin the basketball season up in Pittsburgh, which was great to see, and uh, for the Citadel football team getting ready for Wofford, final home game of the year coming up on Saturday, we'll start to look ahead to that game, but also go back to this past week against Sanford. And as we always begin, I ask you here at midweek as we get ready for the next game, just simply how has the week gone for you guys so far? Well, I gave the guys Sunday off, and uh, it's the first time I've done that in a while. I thought it was important coming off of a 2 o'clock in the morning trip, and we um, kind of refocused ourselves. I didn't give the staff off a little bit, and I said, well, everybody go home, uh, think about it, I said, let's, uh, let's get ourselves straight, let's kind of refocus ourselves for the last two weeks, and uh, let's come back here Tuesday ready to go. So even Sunday and Monday's a typical day off, and uh, uh, you know, the staff came in Monday. We got our game planning done. Uh, it was just, it was just about time for that. And you get ready for Wofford this week. But let's look back at that game against Sanford, where for the, the second straight week it was really about a five-minute stretch. You know, we started the show talking about basketball. I remember growing up playing basketball. They'd always say that the most important minutes of the game were the, the first five minutes of the first half, first five minutes of the second half. In this case, there's been about a five-minute window there in the second quarter, which has led to the game going in a certain direction, and it seemed like that was the case again against Sanford. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, it, it's, it just seems to sneak up on us. We don't know where it's going to be. Um, you know, it, you know it's, it's gotten us in every which way. I keep on saying it in press conferences over and around the week that uh, I don't know where it's going to pop up. You know, it pops up in a punt return. It popped up twice in a punt return the last two weeks. Uh, and then this week it popped up in the red zone on the offensive side as we turn the ball over in the red zone twice. We have an opportunity to score in the first play of the second half or the first drive of the second half. Um, and we're unable to, uh, we're not unable to convert on the fourth down right there. So it's really three turnovers very close to the red zone right there, uh, which one of them resulted in a touchdown. So uh, difficult to overcome, difficult to manage that way, and just seems like you're snake bit all year long. You possessed the football on offense for about 41 minutes, which I know going in that was the idea. You, you, were, you were hoping to get to about 40 minutes. You ran a lot of plays on offense, had a couple of long drives, had it for over 40 minutes. Just in general, what did you think of the offensive performance Saturday? Inconsistent, you know. We had uh, we had that one period, as you kind of mentioned right there in the second quarter, where we, we had about three three and outs right in a row. Two of them were um, really just penalty related. We went first and fifteen on two drives, and uh, you know we have a hard time overcoming those. You know, we, we're, we're all about just turning out first downs. Uh, we were actually pretty good on third and fourth down combined. I thought our, our percentage was over right around fifty percent, which is usually pretty good. And um, you know, unfortunately, you just can't um, you can't hurt yourself all the time and expect to win football games. What are the numbers that we, obviously the final score, you know, the points on the scoreboard, but otherwise, what are the stats or numbers that you do try to focus on the most, whether it's getting ready for a game or coming out of a game to try to assess, you know, your team's performance? Well, this, this week, if you would have told me that we had the ball for 40, 41 minutes and we had 85 plays, I said, you know what, that, that's going to win us a football game. Uh, unfortunately, we gave up a punt, so there's no, there's no offensive plays for that. And we gave up a, a defensive touchdown uh, on the offensive side, which is no plays right there. So, you know, that's, that's a lot where um, you know, the time of possession came from. We had two quick turnarounds right there. But um, that's one of the, you know, that's one of the, the metrics that we look at. The other one is, you know, our third and fourth down conversions, we should be well over 45% between those two combined. If we're around 47 to 48%, I think that's a winning really formula for us. If we're rushing the ball for 300, if we are um, throwing the ball for over 100, we're in pretty good shape there. We were um, over 100, I know that, and we were, you know, under 300 there, unfortunately, in the, in the offensive side, rushing. Yeah, you mentioned that, that that punt return. They had a couple of quick scores in the second quarter. You, ha on offense, had some long drives. So, you know, it helps out in the time of possession to look at things positively. You get to have the football for two-thirds of the game, but does it make things a little more challenging when, on offense, you put together these long drives, and then on defense, they get some of those quick scores. It's just that contrast in styles, you know, that, that you put together a 20-play drive to try to score, and then there they go on one play to score. 
does that make things more difficult? And then the only thing that's really difficult about that is not scoring. You know, if you go 20, you have 15 play drive or a 20 play drive in there, and uh, this has been the really the last three or four weeks where we have struggled on offense is we haven't been able to finish a drive. You know, and that's what we talked about this week was we've got to be able to finish these drives and stick the ball in the end zone. Now this this week it was two turnovers, and, and as I said, they're not converting on the fourth down there, but it was two turnovers. We were in, in pretty good shape to be able to score in both those drives. Um, unfortunately, it just did not go down for us. Let me ask about the one turnover with Jalen because we never got a look at it in person in the booth. They didn't review it. I'm sure you watched the film. I'm just curious. So, uh, cure my curiosity. That play was 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 it uh, clearly a fumble for Jalen, or was it something that maybe? Should... I, I don't think it was clearly a fumble, but you couldn't really tell. The only thing that I that, that I thought may have been worthy of a look was it was so late coming out, mm -hmm. uh, and they may have looked at it. They may have looked at it really quickly, but I don't think. Um, now, my dad watched the TV copy of it, and he said he didn't think it was a fumble there, but um, I have not watched the TV copy of it. I thought the uh, the wide angle that we had, you couldn't see anything in there. The ball did come out pretty late, but it was worthy of a look. I think probably what ended up happening was they did look at it. Um, couldn't tell one way or another, and that's the way it goes. We have four angles where an NFL game has you know, 40 angles or so. Uh, so it's going to be hard to see it from there. So um, one of those things, it shouldn't even be an issue. You know, we missed a block up front. Uh, Jalen's, you know, caught a pile right there. We got to hold on to the football. We got to make a block. With that said, humor me that it must be frustrating, though. You know, the onside kick gets reviewed for who knows how long. Then you have a fumble. It doesn't take a look on a turnover that leads to a touchdown. I'm sure while you're on the sidelines, unable to look at a replay, I imagine that is frustrating. You know, I think the onside kick, it's a little bit clearer of a view there. As you're right out in the middle of the field, the wide angle has got a pretty good look at it. But, yeah, it is frustrating. And that's the way that it goes at our level. We're not going to have all those different. We won't have, you know, more than four angles on in any game, you know, I don't even think at home we'd have that many angles as well. So um, it is challenging. It is. It's frustrating, but it's the way we have gone for us. 21 play scoring drive. I, I didn't go back to my notes. Not yet. I'll have it for Saturday. But I didn't go back to look for 2019. I know for the last two years it's the longest scoring drive this year or last year. So just take us through that because I'm sure that's like the epitome of what you like to accomplish. A 21 yard play drive. You had the football for over 10 minutes. You end up scoring. What works so well on that possession? Well, we can the third and fourth downs, and that was big. We have, you know, we're going to have to have a few third and fourth down conversions there. Um, on one hand, it, it, it's nice, and on one hand, it's, it's really good to have those drives there. But on the other hand, as you'd like to think, at some point, you're going to bust one. And uh, we were so close at times. We were just um, a hair off, whether it was a block here or there, or just a subtle cut here and there, or maybe even a check here and there. But those are the things that have to go right in those drives, and we've got to be on point uh, if we're going to have 20 22, 23 play drives like we've had in the past here uh, in order to convert for touchdowns. And, and really, we really the defense out. And uh, I, I thought we played well enough on defense. We gave up the one touchdown there that was pretty quick. But other than that, we played well enough on defense to be able to keep us in the football game, which is my main concern. Um, and then the special teams and the offensive turnovers got us. Let's go back to the onside kick. Uh, when did that become the plan? Was it once you went to locker room at halftime? Do you think going into that game you'd have to be a little aggressive, take us through the uh, idea for the onside kick? Well, I think Turner did a good job and he looked at it and uh, he saw that we had it to begin with. So we practiced it, we repped it. Uh, it was something that we had in our back pocket, and uh, he asked me, came to me right at the half, he goes, do you think it's a good time to, to do the outside kick? I said, yeah, sure, but, you know, I think it's great to try to steal a possession right here, and uh, if we can't turn the momentum, you know, we had zero momentum in that game, and uh, we did, and it gave us an opportunity to be able to go down and score. Uh, as I said, unfortunately, we got stalled right around the 29-30 yard line. Your program has been really good with onside kicks. You've recovered at least one in three straight years. You've had different special teams coordinators over the years and still su success without revealing the secrets to other teams. I mean, what goes into that? Because especially with new rules and everything, it can be very tough to get onside kicks. I mean, your team's over 50% over the last, I think, it's six years. What are some of the things that go into being able to be successful there? Well, number one is you've got to be aggressive. And you've got to look for it. And you've got to have the, the nerve to call it. Because you're going to give them the ball at the 45, 50-yard line right there if you don't watch out. And, uh, you know, there's just certain times where I think it's good. It's, uh, we need to be 
aggressive in everything that we do, and uh, we got to make sure that, it, including the special teams game, that we be more aggressive. So we got to go for it on fourth down on offense. We've got to pressure and blitz a little bit more than most teams do on defense, and we've got to try some onside kicks and do some different things and have some fakes available to us as well. You kind of touched on it earlier. I know you mentioned in the press conference about um, you know just the way things have gone this year, some of the bad breaks, and even as we already discussed, there was certainly about that five-minute window where the game really swung. How do you take a game like that and turn that from a loss into a win? And I know this is something that you guys are working on every day, but, but what's that like as a process to take these these tough losses where it's just a few plays here, make a few changes, and turn those into the wins? Well, I told the guys yesterday, I, I sat them down and I, I spent some time after practice and I said, look, I said, there's a couple of things that are going on here right now. And number one is, uh, we had a really good practice yesterday. So let me preface it with that. We, we got out there, we had a great inside run drill. I thought the kids were fired up, the play was really good. Um, and I said, you know what, you came out here with the attitude that you were going to practice well. You came out here with the attitude that you're going to win this football game. And you need to carry this same attitude on on a Saturday because I think this is a winning effort right here. You're a winning effort on a Tuesday. Night. And I don't think we've had really terrible weeks of practice. We've had some bad days within a week of practice. Um, so it's not that it, uh, our guys are down. And we are fighting through a few things. We understand a few things that we've got to go through. Um, we're going to fight through this adversity. We're going to fight through adversity last spring as well. And we're going to continue to fight as much as we possibly can. And uh, it, it was all about their attitude, their effort. And those are things that they can control. And the last thing I said to them before they left is, you got to believe that you can win. And I don't think that we believe that we can win the last few weeks. So we need to start believing that we can win every single week. I believe that we can win every single week. I turn it on. I, I see us um, in the best possible light. I see the 22 play drive that we finish. I see those, those drives. Um, I just haven't seen it consistently yet. And um, that's what we've got to get over. And we're, we're, we're challenged every single day with that. Um, and really, it comes down to it's all in our heads at this point. It's, it's all believing that we can win right now. Yeah, so you mentioned that idea for the belief to win, but as you also said, you know, going back to practice yesterday about how the team came out there, good energy. So even with the adversity, some of the tough losses, it must be nice to see the guys still coming out and getting after it and not giving in to that frustration. Oh, no, absolutely. And, and that was my whole point was um, they came out like they were ready to go and they were ready to play. And, you know, they were tired of what had happened. And I said, you've got to capture this moment. You've got to carry this thing all the way to Saturday. Now, it may be that we had Saturday. Sunday and Monday off and we came out with just more energy uh, and maybe that we were just tired of the way that things are going and we're willing to make that change um, and hopefully that's what it is right now. We'll continue to talk about the Bulldogs and get ready for the game coming up Saturday against Wofford as we're just getting started here at the head coach of the Bulldogs, Coach Brent Thompson, for the coaches show that we do every Wednesday here during the football season from Big John's Tavern. Come down and see us in person every week, 251 East Bay Street. The place is now owned and operated by three Citadel grads. And the coaches show brought to you by Cutwater Spirits each and every week. We'll continue to break things down, get ready for the last home game of the season, which is coming up this Saturday for the Citadel throughout the hour here on the coaches show. Coming up next on the Citadel. Sports Network.
John's Tavern in downtown Charleston, talking Citadel football with the head coach of the Bulldogs, Coach Brent Thompson. We uh, started off talking about the big win against Pittsburgh last night for the basketball team, and then I realized you spent time in Pennsylvania coaching. I know not Pittsburgh. Did you ever spend much time ever get over to Pittsburgh? No, you know, when I first got there, I recruited Pittsburgh. Now when I was, um, when I went to Dickinson College my first year in 98-99, I recruited a lot of Pittsburgh. Now when I was uh, at Bucknell and I spent uh, 2003 to 2009 there, um, I didn't recruit any Pittsburgh. Now I would make some trips down there. We would do some coaches tours down there with the head coach. Uh, my dad's originally from Pittsburgh, so I did enjoy going down there. My, a lot of my dad's family still has some family down there, but um, and I am, by the way, a Pitt fan. Just through my dad, I'm a Penguin fan, as you know. Yeah. Uh, but I'm a Pitt fan, a fan through my dad and my grandma. Uh. Um, but I'm certainly glad to see um, Coach Brock and beat those guys. Yeah. You ever get uh, one of those Primanti brother sandwiches? And you're I, have, I have not no? gotten to it yet. Uh, uh, no, it's funny. I, I walked by it the last time that I was there. I was in there for a, uh, a Pittsburgh club function there. Uh, uh, I walked by it a couple times, just touring my, my own way around Pittsburgh a little bit. was going to stop in. I just, you know, I just didn't know if I could do that to myself. <laughs> um, I had just gotten done with a run, feeling good about myself. Yeah. I didn't know if I could tear myself down so quickly, uh, although I've done that many times. <laughs> That's what Coach Brock so he went for before the game, and he said usually he doesn't like to you know eat before a game like that. You want to take it light, but they walked past it, and uh, he said it was the best fries they've ever had. What about, by the way, in terms of more locally or even when uh, on this trip for Sanford, I've always said the, the best cookies I've ever had are at the Double Tree. You ever get the cookies when you when you guys stay at those hotels? You know, I, I used to do a lot of it, and uh, when we stay at the one up here in North Charleston, our, our kids flock to that. Oh, thing. Yeah. And we, we used to have our meetings up there on Fridays, and they, they used to bring in a plate full of those cookies. Uh, phenomenal cookies, but uh, it's been a lot better for my waistline that we haven't been up there this year. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Uh, let's get back to the, the football team themselves, and uh, looking back at Saturday, we saw pretty much the debut of Jay Graves Billups, the, the freshman A-back who returned some kicks, got some carries, seven carries on Saturday, showed some speed. What did you like from him out there getting some runs Saturday? Well, I love the burst that he has. I love the fact that he's young, he's fresh legged out there. Um, I love the fact that he went out there and really played air free football, you know, he um, was on a kick return team right there, now he needs to get vertical a little bit quicker on the kick return there, he was trying to hunt and pack, and uh, he even came off, I, I said on uh, Tuesday he was back there, I said, look, um, just get just get hard straight and fast is the way that we go on kick off return, he goes, yeah, I know, a little high school out there, I said, hey, uh, at least you know, I said, just, just get straight up there, everybody's going to be fast on this field, hit vertical seams, uh, but he did give us a little bit of a burst, and um, he's a guy that I've been talking about for like the last two or three weeks about trying to get more reps, I finally pulled the trigger on it. Uh, I said, look, we, we just got to play him. If he's going to make a mistake out there, we're going to live with it at this point. Um, but he didn't. I thought he, he played really well. He made very few mistakes out there, played extremely hard, um, and gave us a chance. I had a 20, 29 yard run or so. Mm -hmm. uh, got, got around the edge. So excited to see him. Excited for the future of him. I know you mentioned it uh, during a press conference on Monday, but for those that didn't hear, I, I thought it was a pretty interesting story just how he wound up here with you guys. What was that process like to get him here to the Citadel? Well, it was interesting because he was committed for the whole time he was committed to Army and uh, you know unfortunately that's uh, it, Army's got a lot of those guys and a lot of those guys have been really really wanting recruiting it's tough to beat those guys uh, they're doing a really good job in recruiting right now uh, and they can collect as many of them as they possibly can well uh, he contacted one of our coaches and uh, it was Coach Mitchie's down there and he said look um, I'm committed to Army but I don't know that I really want to go and I, it was maybe the service commitment it was a little bit far from home he said and the dad had had a connection here, had been to Charleston, been stationed in Charleston, I believe. Um, a military family, great folks. And uh, we, we did a, we did a um, Zoom visit with him and uh, explained to him how we went on here and dealt a lot with the dad. The dad kind of, you know, was able to relay a lot of information to Jay and give him, uh, you know, as much of the lay of the land as possible without having, having to visit. And then I do believe he did come in the spring after he'd already signed. So, great visit, really enjoyed it. And and uh, really enjoyed having him right now. He's a terrific kid. I know Coach Brockham talked about it on the basketball side, but how difficult was that recruiting-wise to have to do it through Zoom, especially at the Citadel? People may be intimidated when they hear about this military school, but when you come see it and visit the beautiful campus, right, that I'm sure can sway people. You see the facilities. Uh, how much of a challenge was it to do everything through Zoom? It was really it was difficult. It was uh, you're trying to paint a picture. You're trying to do. We have a website just dedicated to just a football recruiting. It's got certain links to our own 
website to our school website. We've got the virtual tour link in there, which uh, the school did a wonderful job of putting together a three-dimensional virtual tour out there, uh, which was, you know, it was functional, but still you don't have that feel. Um, I mean, you know, we, we have this connotation about us right now when you've got the fences and everything else around. It's, it's a little standoffish until you get inside and understand that we operate as a traditional school. Um, the people inside of it are fairly normal. Is, uh, our kids are fairly normal. That was the biggest part was just not being able to get them with our players. Not being able to understand that they like to do the same things that, um, that you do. They like to hang out with their buddies and play video games. It's just they saw themselves in a different um, light at the end of the day. You know? and, and that's what we had to constantly convey to them. Uh, and, and we have to do a wonderful job of recruiting parents to usually help us out. Yeah, certainly. Now, uh, just to, to go back to Jay, I'm just curious. The offense, the offense that he played in in high school, is it similar to the option offense? Not really. You know, there's some, what, I would say his skill set was really um, fitting for our offense. He's just one of those guys that um, was quick. He's got great ball skills, which is, you know, it's, it's hard to find a little bit of a combination of all those things because of what we ask those guys to do uh, and blocking. And he's got enough quick twitch about him that he was a pretty good blocker on film as well. In general, do you, can that be a difficult transition for just running backs that come from a different offense in high school to get acclimated to this offense? It's really hard. And it's, uh, that's why we, and that's why Army takes a lot of them is because the, some of them don't make it and they just kind of wash out. And uh, some of them are, you know, just really adapt really well to it. And it, it, it's great because there's, there's a lot of those guys out there because not a lot of people are taking, you know, Javante's 5'8", 5'9", he's 170 pounds, 180 pounds or so. Uh, not a whole lot of teams are taking those kind of guys anymore. So there's a lot of those guys to be found out there. So um, we've got to be able to just find the right ones that fit us and that can do a lot of different things for us. Tyler Cherry had another good day. He had all the receptions once again. He's been playing really well. So you have two, you know, call them both freshmen. They're both playing for the first time here this season. You have two freshmen there that are, seem to be early on small sample, but, you know, playmakers for you guys. We do. And uh, we ended up starting a, a you know, redshirt freshman at the right guard spot as well. And we ended up starting a sophomore at the left guard spot too. So we're really into this young phase. And I thought uh, it was just by default. You know, we've had some guys that are injured. Tyler came along really, really well when, when Ryan McCarthy was out. So next year when we get Ryan back and we have Tyler back, we still have two really good wide receivers out there. Um, my expectation on that first throw was a 35-yard reception was we're going to throw it to Raleigh. And uh, all of a sudden I see the ball sail. I mean, Raleigh's wide open. And I see the ball sail over to the wheel. And uh, Tyler makes a great catch on it. It's a 30, 29-yard you know, reception right there. Yeah, so you lead me right to my next question. I was going to ask, was that the plan? Did you want to come out and take a chance downfield? Yeah, well, I said that we were going to send the offensive guys. I said, well, you know, what do we have to lose? Let's take a shot here on first down. And uh, let's kind of back them off of us a little bit and see what we can get out of it. And that being great, uh, unfortunately, we didn't, the next set of downs is we didn't convert very well on first down. I think we got one or two yards, and that's where we got set back. On the other side of the football, because of injuries, various things, some other guys have to, had to step in on defense. Who are some of the names, if we were to highlight some guys that you've been impressed with who have been you know, either thrown out there or just had to step in, fill a void, and have done a good job doing so? Well, Kyler has stepped in there. Kyler is now he's an upperclassman. He's a senior. He hasn't had a whole lot of playing time, but he played fair. And uh, we're excited for just the fact that he's getting an opportunity to play in there. But we got some guys on the back end that are still playing extremely well. Um, I, I thought Wilson Hendricks, who's really only a sophomore, played a lot last year in the spring just out of necessity. Um, played really well out there. And then Don Poole continues to play extremely well on the back end. And um, so, you know, I think we're, we're getting better. Jamie playing really well. We're getting better guys in there. We're getting some playing time. So some of those younger guys in there. Uh, K.J. Pierce, only a sophomore in there. Redshirt freshman really playing a lot of downs for us in there. So we still have a lot of, you know, it's a, it's a mixture of some old guys and some young guys in there right now that um, it's going to help us in the future. So going back to Saturday's game, you know, they had a defensive touchdown, a special teams touchdown. So when your defense was on the field, obviously didn't surrender all those points. Going up against a top 10 scoring offense in the country, held Liam Welch to one of his quieter days, really in his career. Um, just overall, what did you think of your defense's performance Saturday? As I said before, I thought they played well enough to win. You know, we kept the ball in front of us, and that was Tony's goal right there. He kept the, um, all the receptions. We got an interception there right in the end zone right at the, uh, on the first drive. 
what, what we told them to do is, was kind of what they did, is they're going to run the football, we're going to make them run the football. And I thought Tony's plan was, you know, was right, is let's, uh, let's make them pound the ball at us a little bit and let's make them kill the clock a little bit on their end of it and keep the ball in front of us and maybe frustrate them. Maybe they don't want to run the ball as much. It was last Thursday after our coaches show last week where Willie posted on Twitter about the knee operation out for the year. Um, obviously a huge loss for the defense, but for Willie, well, let me first ask you this before we get to his future. Just what has he meant to the program when he's actually been out there playing for you guys? Well, you know, Willie's been a, he's, he's been a staple of our defense really for the last five years. And uh, he's kind of been the guy out there. He's made a lot of tackles. He's made a lot of great plays. Uh, we really haven't, up until the last two years, we haven't had a need for a linebacker. And uh, Anthony Britton came in, and we ended up playing him at the other linebacker spot just to uh, have two really good linebackers in there. And it's, it, it is noticeable at times when those two guys aren't in there. Not that, as I said, Kyler's done a really good job, and Jamez is doing a really good job in there. But there's certain things that they just haven't seen, they haven't experienced yet that um, is really critical to our defense. You know, Tony's got um, a lot of different looks, a lot of different fronts that he's going to play on, and he's going to play a lot of different personnel groupings that those guys knew. And uh, Willie was able to uh, come in, adapt, and do really well. Tony's first year here gets the All-American status there. Same thing with Britton, comes in, does a good job, has 100 tackles last year. And uh, so getting back to Willie there, I said, is – not only is he a great guy on the football field, he's a great football player, but he meant a lot in the locker room. He didn't say a whole lot, but when he said something, the kids listened. And uh, we were all, and I was devastated when, uh, when I, we found out the news. We kind of knew what it was coming to. Uh, I sent him a message last, uh, last week on my way to Sanford because we actually passed through Augusta where he's from. And uh, I said, you know, I remember when we recruited you. I remember doing the home visit. Um, I remember, the, you know, just the, the younger Willie when we first got you out of, uh, out of Laney High School. And uh, you know, I'm very proud of the young man that he's become. And no matter whether football pans out for him or not, uh, he's going to be excellent in whatever he does. Yeah, it's unfortunate. This is how his Citadel career has to end. Most tackles for a Bulldog since 2000. But now moving forward, once he rehabs, gets ready for him and even Raleigh Webb as well, what – do you perceive to be their future? What have maybe you heard of teams, scouts contact you about them uh, once their careers are over here, you know, trying to go to that next level? Yeah, we've had quite a few teams in. We've had probably about 20 teams in or so for both of them. Uh, Willie, right now, probably we would love to be able to get him into a free agent at this point, get him into a junior day. Uh, he's a, certainly he's going to be a big, good-looking guy in there. He's going to run fairly well. Um, unfortunately, he just didn't have a whole lot of tape over the last two years. Uh, Raleigh the same way, but I, Raleigh may have a more of a chance, uh, being that he's been, been a little bit more healthy. He's got the speed to go with it. Uh, he's willing to block. Everybody, what they're – what they're saying about it, uh, uh, Raleigh's attribute is, 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 is a special teams play. He's, he's going to be able to go down there, run down there, be, you know, be a backup wide receiver and be a special teams player. The other linebacker you mentioned, Anthony Britton, do you anticipate having him back this week? We do. Yeah, uh, Anthony's been back practicing with us, and uh, good to get him back in there for uh, not just the tackles, but as I say, it's just kind of setting the defense and knowing where everybody's supposed to go. And the other guy I'll ask you about on defense, Andy Davis was linebacker. You had him at play safety. Now he's had to fill that void as a linebacker. How valuable has it been to have somebody like that that can play at both those levels? You know, Andy's huge for us because he can do it and he can process most of it. So if we're seeing one of those passing teams, we do like to play him a little bit down into the box and uh, because he's going to get matched up on some of those guys. But also Andy's a guy that he's a jack of all trades and he's going to be able to, to, to transition back and forth uh, really, really well. So you're going to need – uh, those guys uh, as a wild card in your defense no matter what. And uh, we're going to go ahead and try to recruit one this year just to, just to replace them. Here's the last thing I'll ask you that involves Sanford, but it goes back to the last visit to Sanford, that four-overtime game. I meant to ask you this week, I'm still curious of your opinion, what do you think of the new rule that was put into place where once you get to what the third overtime, it becomes a two-point competition? What are your thoughts on that? Well, being a little bit of a fan of the XFL, that was the XFL rule. Now, that was the XFL rule right from the start there. They were going to go um, top of the inning, top, bottom of the inning with the, uh, the two-point conversion, which was kind of cool. Uh, I, I, I think it makes some sense there is what's unfortunately happening is you do have teams out there that are running 120 plays. Teams like Sam are running 120 plays. If you do go into four and five overtimes with it, you're talking 150 plays out there 
that's a lot of plays for, for guys. I mean, it, it's killing your next week. It's killing your guys. So in order to try to shorten the game a little bit, make the game a little bit more exciting, um, very rarely, I mean, shoot, that, that, I think that was the only four overtime game that I was a part of. Uh, very rarely does it happen. Um, but it is certainly the expectation. It, it forces you to prepare a lot more two-point plays than you have. Um, usually I would carry about three. We carry about five right now. Yeah, that was my next question because I know it was uh, Illinois, Penn State went to nine, and they said afterwards we ran out of two-point plays. Do. So, yeah, that was my question is what that process is like. You, do you save plays for a two-point conversions? How many do you have? What's that, what's that whole idea? Yeah, we do. Is we, we typically have, um, you know, three to five. As I say, we carry five a week now. Just We, tr we try to rep as many as we possibly uh -huh. can. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, you get beyond that, and, and you're grabbing at straws at that point. <laughs> we'll see if that uh, comes into play anytime soon in the uh, Southern Conference. Um, when we come back, we'll get ready for the Citadel's final home game of the year. Hard to believe we've already arrived at this point. It's Saturday against Wofford, 2 p.m. kickoff. It's also another homecoming weekend for the Bulldogs, so we will start.
Even uh, when we're not here, even when it's not a Wednesday, owned and operated by Citadel Grads and uh, the Coaches Show, brought to you by Cutwater Spirits each and every week as we talk Citadel football. Coming off the game against Sanford this past week, the long trip there, back home, now getting ready for Wofford this week at home. Final home game of the year, hard to believe, at least for me, we've already reached here the final two weeks of the season, last home game. Uh, so I'm just curious, as a coach, does it feel like the season – does it feel like a long season? Does it feel like it goes quickly? As a coach, what's it, what's it like for you? Well, you know, it, usually typically during these seasons, it, it feels like a very long season. And uh, I think coupled with the spring season, it starts to wear on you a little bit more than a typical year would. But, um, yeah, it's a uh, it, it, it's felt pretty long. And uh, we got two weeks left. But, you know, on the other hand, is it, it, it's been pretty quick, too. I mean, shoot, next thing you know is it – Thanksgiving's here, and we're, yeah. we're gone for the semester, and then we'll come back ready for the spring. Obviously, the record, not what you had hoped or anticipated this year, but how, in, how important is it to try to build some momentum and head into the offseason on, on the right foot? Well, and that's what I, t I kept on telling the guys right there is we have an opportunity here is we need to start the season. We need to start next year right here, and we need to start getting better and uh, preparing ourselves for the next season. But uh, we've got a very important game this week. Number one is it's homecoming. Number two is it's Wofford. You know, we play for a trophy in this game. And uh, this has been a back and forth. No matter what their record is, I think this is a good football team. Yeah, let's focus on a couple of things you just touched on first with this team themselves. Obviously, their record's not great, but they've played four games this year that have been decided by less than a touchdown, so they've had some close games in there. Uh, obviously, as, as you kind of just said, a team you can't look past. They're coming here. It is for a trophy. They're going to want to beat you. So even though you look at the record, you look at some of the numbers, certainly not a team that you can take lightly come Saturday. No, absolutely not. As you look at these guys on defense, and I think they're pretty good. They've got some good stout players in there. They've got two experienced linebackers in there. They've got uh, some bigger guys up front. And, uh, you know, they replaced a couple of their um, their guys last year with uh, with a couple of junior college guys and some transfer guys in there. So, they're, they're you know, I think they're pretty good on defense. Offensively, watching them over the last couple of weeks, they have uh, struggled a little bit for an identity. And that's going to happen. You know, that's going to happen when you're transitioning from one style of an offense to another. Yeah, you, you bring that up. Uh, you know, they had Mike Ayers here for 30 years as the head coach. Josh Conklin comes in. Um, how different is this team for, you know, they haven't been here to the low country now. Some Citadel fans maybe haven't seen them since 2019. So when they watch them on Saturday, how different does this team look nowadays compared to what many were used to for really decades at Wofford? Well, they, they, they still have the two really good running backs left over, which uh, I mentioned in the press conference. Those are two, probably the best two combination of guys in the league. And uh, I would, you have to, you have to, have to account for those guys and, and make sure that you have those guys um, tackled before you can do anything else. Uh, from there is they've been a little bit of a revolving door at quarterback. They are trying to get a little bit of their identity established with the, the double tight end looks with uh, they're, they're still trying to make an emphasis on running the football, but they also want to throw it a little bit. So it's just a matter of them finding their group as well and finding what they can do and finding a little bit of their recruiting as well um, and, and how they can, you know, recruit to, to their offense, to their new offense now that Coach Lang is gone. I know they've used four different quarterbacks this year. Does it make a difference which one's out there, or is it more about here's what they're going to do on offense anyways? It doesn't matter who's taking the snaps. This is what to expect. No, there is a little bit of a pattern there. There are more, uh, one quarterback runs it better than the other, just runs the ball a little bit better. One throws it a little bit better. Um, and then they're going to rely on the, on the running back. So the key, is, the key is more the running backs than it is the quarterbacks. As you mentioned, rivalry game playing for a trophy. Uh, obviously, you know, again, um, uh, not as many W's this year as hoped, but you go back to last year, beat Furman Wofford last year, beat VMI here this year. Now a chance to beat uh, Wofford once again. So... How important is it to make sure you get these wins in these rivalry games uh, and try to now build a little bit of a winning streak here against Wofford? Well, yeah, there's two things there. One is that um, we, need to, we need to start to get a little bit of a, of a, of a, um, of a winning streak of our own, right? We, we've got to kind of get off of this little bit of a bad train that we've been on, and we've got to, we've got to turn the ship around, so to speak. Uh, and then the other thing is, is, is 
you got two two games at the end of the year. Go out there, compete your rear end off, and try to do the best that you possibly can out there, and uh, steal a couple wins, and you know make yourself feel a little bit better. And that's what I told you guys: is uh, a win will make you feel a lot better, and uh, a win this week will make you feel a whole a lot better. And just like last year, is all we just kept on doing was we won two of the last three at the end. And uh, played fairly well all throughout the year. We just didn't have an opportunity to win as many games uh, in the last spring. But we just we held it together. We did as best we possibly could. And we ended up winning a couple at the end. Well, same thing this year. We just got to hold it together, uh, do the best we possibly can, and get a couple wins at the end. You mentioned homecoming. It is the final home game of the regular season. 2 o'clock kickoff, by the way. Come out and join us in person. If you can't, coverage begins at 1 p.m. on the radio network all across the country. You can listen online from anywhere in the world. But hopefully you'll be there with us in person on Saturday. Of course, a lot of alum will be there for homecoming. Uh, my broadcast partner, Lee Glaze, it's one of his, uh, it's his year, so he'll be out there uh, taking part in the festivities throughout the afternoon around the broadcast as well. So, of course, it's a, it's a big day, but uh, final home game of the year, homecoming as well. So, you know, what does that mean to, for some of these guys to take the field at home in front of the home crowd for the final time this season? Well, it's homecoming. It's also senior day. Right, you have yeah. senior day for six, you know, six-year guys, some fifth-year guys in there. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be about 20, 25 or so guys out there that are playing their last game. Um, and it's kind of fitting that it is on homecoming. It's kind of nice because they'll have a good crowd out there. Um, it is partly their day as well as it's their final home day. And, uh, you know, we're going to miss a lot of those guys. It's felt, you know, guys like Raleigh have been there for so long. It's felt like they've been there. Well, they've been there the whole time that I've been the head coach, uh, which has been kind of nice to have. And uh, it'll be really weird not having a football team without some of those. Get J.B. Lewis out there. Uh, Jonathan Toole, this may be his last go around of it. Tayden Haas has been there. So uh, a lot of guys are up front right there. Raleigh Webb and, um, of course, Willie on the, uh, on the defensive side. We don't lose as many defensive guys. Uh, we're going to hopefully get some of those guys back for their fifth years and maybe some guys back for six years on that side of the ball, too. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. It, it can always be tough, and then you throw in last year, COVID, everyone gets an extra year of eligibility. It, it, it can be tough for somebody like me who is outside looking in trying to figure out eligibility. Are there still guys that they're trying to figure out, or you as a coaching staff wondering, you know, are they going to come back next year if they have an extra year of eligibility? Is this? Yeah, we do. Is, is, you know, uh, we do have, we have a couple of guys up there that still have opportunities there. Now, it, it's, it's hard to say at this point. You're having a rough year. Those guys are really banged up. Yeah. Some of those guys may turn around and say, look, they would like to play it out. They'd like to finish their master's degree, which is certainly uh, something that we would uh, we would support as well. And then there's certain guys that uh, have opportunities that are going to get the you know maybe the job that they really want. And we saw that last year with Sean Thomas Faulkner, and uh, he was a guy that was going to come back and decided that he had a job that he really liked and uh, missed football, and now he's out in North Texas. Um, you mentioned uh, Hayden Hawes in, in the, the list of names. He's somebody that has missed one game you know, at, at the center position. It was last year against Sanford. Uh, just from a, a football perspective, you know, like Alabama's center went down this past week. They managed only six rushing yards against LSU, their fewest since 1940. Uh, random stat, teams that lose their center, you lose 87% of your, your next games when you have to replace your center. All that's to, to say, I mean, how important is it to have that guy and be consistent. You know he's going to be out there every week. He has that report, the quarterback at the center position. How, how crucial has he been? <laughs> he's been huge. Uh, at the end of last year, I didn't think he was going to come back and take even his fifth year. And uh, I was a little bit nervous about that. He came to me and, you know, at the end of last year and said he would like to come back for a fifth year. Uh, and I, I was certainly relieved. I thought that it gives you a lot of stability there as a guy that knows all the calls in there. He's seen it. He's done it. He's a 300-pound guy. He can hold up against zero nose guards in there. Um, he plays through. I mean, believe it or not, he is banged up. He is bruised up every single week, but he keeps on going. He gets his treatment. He doesn't say anything. One of the toughest dudes out there. Uh, love having him around, and if I can keep him around for a sixth year, I definitely will. So um, I'm still tr I'm still recruiting at this point. <laughs> yeah, that uh, that center, uh, a very underrated but crucial part to uh, any offense and what you try to do offensively. Time for our final timeout. We'll come back, put the finishing touches on this as we get ready for the last home game with Wofford coming to town this Saturday, 2 p.m. kickoff. Coverage begins at 1 o'clock across the network. Again, homecoming, so for many coming back to uh, the area, um, to come see the Bulldogs and go out in the field and be part of the festivities this weekend. It's a big deal. Final home game of the season. So we're looking forward to the Citadel and Wofford coming up Saturday at 2 o'clock. Coach's Show brought to you by Cutwater Spirits from Big John's Tavern here every Wednesday night located at 251 East Bay Street in downtown Charleston. Come back with the final segment. Put the finishing touches on tonight. Get ready for Saturday against Wofford next here on the Citadel Sports Network.
Show here with the head coach of the Bulldogs, Coach Brent Thompson, for our final segment tonight. The Coach's Show brought to you by Cutwater Spirits as we get ready for the Bulldogs game this Saturday against Wofford at home. Final home game of the year, 2 p.m. kick. Coverage begins at 1 p.m. all across the radio network and come out and join us in person for homecoming this week as we uh, hang out tonight at Big John's Tavern. You can come out and see us every Wednesday or check them out any other night as well. Even we're not here, 251 East Bay Street, owned and operated by three Citadel grads. We uh, got a lot of smash burgers going tonight. Are you a, uh, and they're fantastic, by the way, if you come out and try the smash burger, are you a grill master at all? Uh, I do my fair share out there. Yeah. I mean, you know, I can, I can hold my own on the grill. I don't consider myself a master of it, but I, uh, I can go out there and, you know, cook with the best of them. I, I found the open fire is kind of where I really Ooh. enjoyed it, is uh, my parents have got an open fire grill down there at their place. I've um, Played around with some different wood down there. I really mm -hmm. enjoyed it. It's kind of a, an opportunity to kind of sit outside and do it yeah. uh, rather than get off the gas grill a little bit. I haven't ventured too much into the charcoal lately. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that would be next. But I, I, I must say this. I'm very impressed by your willpower to sit here and look <laughs> at your uh, right. gorgeous uh, asparagus yes. and your smash burger right here without even touching it. Um, meanwhile, uh, Caden and I over here have hammered ours down yes. and have gotten indigestion probably from it, but <laughs> I certainly have enjoyed it because I don't think I could sit there and look at it as you have. I mean, it's a, quite the, the talent that you have right there. Thank skill. you. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a, the only impressive thing I can do is not eat food right away. Uh, I have to wait till I get off the air so that I'm not, uh, you know, I can speak clearly, but uh, that's, that's, and I get the asparagus with the smash burger. It's like going through the McDonald's drive through and getting a Diet Coke. I and the, as, the asparagus makes me feel better about uh, everything. Uh, let's talk about the game against Wofford on Saturday. You mentioned the running backs. I was going to ask you, when you look at this Wofford team, you know, what do they do best? What's the strength? But you have mentioned the running backs a couple times, so I imagine that seems to be their strength, their running game. Yeah, absolutely. Those two guys. And uh, they do have some RPOs. I've seen them hit a couple RPOs. I watched them in the ETSU game. They do have uh, some RPOs in there, but you, you have to be careful. Now, they still do have a little bit uh, in their offense of what they used to do. They have some little bit of uh, – Kind of some zone option in there, some veer option looking out of the shotgun. And uh, any time that you have that with those two running backs is you have to be careful. Defensively, uh, you, you touched on the defense a little bit earlier. Joe Beckett is one of the leading tacklers in the conference. He has about twice as many tackles as anyone else on that defense. I believe you said that you guys even recruited him. So, yeah. so we he's recruited been him leader. and we offered him here. We had him on a visit here. I thought we had a good opportunity to get him. Uh, they came in a little bit uh, after us and, and, and swept in and took him away from us. But um, I was very, I was very impressed with uh, who he is, with the kind of player he is, and uh, I've watched him progress all the way throughout. And uh, he is a guy that you really have to kind of keep track of on their defense. Josh Conklin was here at one time. He's been there for a few years. So, you know, there's, um, I guess, no surprises when you line up Saturday. They know what to expect from you. What do you expect for their defense? Well, you know, Josh does a really good job on defense. He's going to build up his defense. Now, last year, his defense was pretty banged up when we played him at the end of the year. So I think they had to do a few things differently there. This year's defense, they've got some bigger, stout guys in there, more of what he wants to do, who he wants to play with in there. So it's going to be a challenge. We have to have to get better on first down and uh, that that's really the key to our offense is it we cannot uh, we cannot miss a read on first down we cannot miss a block on first down we cannot miss a cut on first down we have to be able to uh, establish our run game starting right with the first down they are statistically last in the conference in offense but they are number two in both punt return and kick return so how important will it be to limit any short fields for their offense on saturday well, they do have a really good kick returner out there. I think he does a really good job. We just got done watching him yesterday, and, uh, you know, it's been a little bit of a up and down for our kickoff team, so we've got to be careful there. We've got to make sure that we've got uh, all of our lanes covered. We've got to make sure that we've got uh, the ability to be able to keep them bottled up, boxed in right there. Uh, and the kick's got to be on point. So on the kickoff side of things, uh, Matty, you know, Matty hasn't kicked real well. We've got to get him kind of back going again. Uh, on the punt return, we've got to make sure that we get a good high kick and uh, that we get down there and cover the kick return better than we did last week. Uh, last week, it just takes one guy to get pinned and out of position, and that's how you end up with a punt return for a touchdown. Winding down about our final 90 seconds tonight as we get ready for the Citadel and Wofford Saturday. Always end by asking you keys, and I'm sure we've touched on them, but to summarize, what are your keys to the game on Saturday? Well, more, more importantly, what we've been stressing uh, as a staff to the team is just overcoming the adversity. Uh, as you mentioned it, those five minutes that get us every single game for the last three or four games is we've got to overcome it, whether it's on a special teams player, it's on an offensive play, and it's a 
uh, we've got to overcome that. We've got to put it behind us. Uh, sometimes it comes in the form of a penalty. Sometimes it comes in the form of a turnover. Sometimes it comes in the form of a big defensive play or a big uh, special teams play. Those are the things that we've got to be able to recover from. And uh, we've got to get over that hump. We've got to establish ourselves as a team that can face adversity and go ahead and um, overcome that obstacle. Well, that's the goal Saturday for the Bulldogs as they welcome in Wofford. Two o'clock kickoff Saturday. It is homecoming. It is senior day. It's the final home game of the year for the Bulldogs. So come out and join us for one final time here in 2021 and come support the Citadel at home for the final home game of the year. 2 p.m. kickoff. Coverage will begin at 1 p.m. across the radio network. If you can't make it, you can listen anywhere in the world. Download our app, the City Charleston. Go to thecitycharleston.com or locally listen 102.1 FM, 1450 AM. Or come out in person, bring the radio with you, listen in the stands while you watch the game in person with us Saturday at Johnson Hay. Good 2 p.m. kickoff against Wofford as we finish up the home schedule of 2021. Coach, appreciate the time as always. Wish you guys the best of luck Saturday. Well, enjoy your burger, man. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. I've been waiting for this moment. And uh, we're looking forward to Saturday as well, kicking off against Wofford, 2 p.m. kick. It's been the Coach's Show here from Big John's Tavern, downtown Charleston, 251 East Bay Street. The Coach's Show brought to you by Cutwater Spirits each and every week. Appreciate you hanging with us tonight. Don't forget, kickoff 2 o'clock Saturday against Wofford. We'll see you there. Coverage begins at 1 p.m. all across the Citadel Radio Network. <laughs>